This is my genome. It is my passion. It is my, my profession. And it is the code that actually runs inside my cells. Its story goes back a long time ago. But more recently, in Greece, when my grandparents' chromosomes met in a romantic island, and it was love at first sight. <laughs> Three meiosis events later, through my dad and through my mom, they gave rise to my chromosomes, a new and unique combination from an almost infinite number of possibilities. And this is the worst part about my genome. I have a predisposition to age-related macular degeneration, a form of blindness that could cause me to lose the central part of my vision in the next few years. I have an 8% chance of getting the disease, and you only have a 6% chance. Why? Because I have inherited these three bad mutations in these three genes. None of my family has that exact combination. What do they do? The top and the bottom are, in fact, changing the protein sequence of two different genes, causing their function to change. And the middle one, well, frankly, we have no idea. It's sitting 100,000 nucleotides away from any other gene. But we're going to get back to that later. For now, I want to ask the question that you're probably all wondering about. A, will I get the disease? And B, can science and medicine do something about it? And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. We have undergone a dramatic transformation in the, next, in the last few years. The revolution in molecular biology has led to genome sequencing, and a revolution in technology has made it both commonplace and affordable. And we are now in the midst of a third revolution that's going to change medicine forever. I call it the analysis revolution. A combination of computer science techniques, such as machine learning, statistics, algorithms, that form the foundation of computational genomics. That analysis revolution will take a generation of computational biology students to be one, and perhaps a few celebrated heroes. But once we win that revolution, medicine will be forever changed. How? Well, let me take you through three examples of three hypothetical visits to your doctor, 10 years ago, today, and into the future. 10 years ago, what could do the doctor do about AMD? Well, first of all, he would have to wait until you start losing your vision, because there is no prognosis. He would then give you a pair of glasses for a few years, because frankly, after that, you wouldn't need them anymore. By then, you'd be blind. What about today? Knowing that I have three bad and two good allele combinations, the doctor basically knows that I have a predisposition, and that's already an achievement. But all he can tell me is, don't smoke, watch your cholesterol, and keep an eye on it. <laughs> Unfortunately, genomics hasn't really done much for what we can actually do about disease today. It's like Cassandra being able to predict the future, but being able to do nothing about it without the analysis revolution. So how do we enable a visit to the doctor's office in the future, where you would log on to your own personal genome bank? You would have within it stored the circuit of every single one of your cells tuned to your own particular genome. And you would have cellular models of your retina that you can target with combination drugs that have never been given to anyone before because they are tailored to your combination of alleles, to specifically the genome that you have inherited. And then you can see whether these drugs work in a dish model of your retina cells. And if they do, you can have the cocktail ready for you to take whenever the symptoms appear. Or you can even take it preventively to help the cells fix their own debris and clear out whatever's blocking your retina. So how do we enable that medicine of the future? How do we enable personalized genomics, personalized diagnostics, and personalized treatments? What we need is a systematic understanding of every single nucleotide in your genome. Understand exactly when they're active, exactly how they interact with each other, and exactly what every single mutation will lead to. And that's what the analysis revolution is about. Over the past 10 years, my lab at MIT has developed a series of computational techniques, a series of lenses that you can add to your genome microscope, each lens revealing a different aspect of its function. And we're now using these lenses to understand genomes at an unprecedented level of detail. The first lens relies on comparative genomics. It's the lens of evolution. 
by comparing humans to dozens of other mammals, we can identify the regions that are highly conserved and undoubtedly important. It turns out that only 1% of our genome codes for the 20,000 proteins that make up a human being. The circuitry for making that human being sits somewhere in the other 99%, but we don't know where. And that's where comparative genomics comes in. Using comparative genomics of human and dozens of other mammals, we have revealed that another 5 to 10% of the human genome is actually conserved across species outside the 1% that codes for genes. And that 5% contains sequence patterns known as regulatory motifs that are recognized by specialized proteins that turn genes on and off in different cell types. And that brings us to the second signature, epigenomics, the lens of epigenomics. It turns out that every single cell in your body, as you know, has the exact same genome. But you also know that there are hundreds of cell types and hundreds of tissues, each of which with distinct biology. How is that even possible? It is possible through epigenomics. It is possible because DNA does not sit naked inside your nucleus. It is structured. It is wrapped around these little bundles, which are both structural and informational. It turns out that chemical modifications in these bundles remind every single cell where the genes start and where the control regions are for that cell type. They keep the pages open like post-it notes. And we can exploit these, and we have used these to actually uh, discover more than a million different control regions inside our cells that are active on and off in different cell types. And that's bring, that brings us to the third signature, the lens of cellular circuitry and regulatory genomics. Every single one of these control regions is tightly linked to some other control region in three dimensions, forming a bundle. And they are together linked to the genes that they control. And by observing the activity of each one of these regions and each one of these genes across cell types, we have actually found that those that are connected are turning on and off at the same time. And we have used that to now link them together into circuits with millions of edges that tells exactly how the information flows within the cell. How do these signatures now transform our understanding of genetics? Well, let's go back to my known coding mutation for which we had no idea. Here it is. There's the association right there. It's sitting 100,000 nucleotides away from this TIMP3 gene, which it turns out is associated also with blindness, with a rare genetic disease similar to AMD. The evolution lens tells us that that nucleotide right there that I have, that mutated nucleotide, is in fact disrupting a conserved nucleotide that every single other mammal cares about. So it's undoubtedly important. It could be a regulatory region for that gene. The epigenomics lens tells, tells me that that region is actually active in retinal cells. Bingo. That's a smoking gun. That's exactly where we need to focus to understand the disease. And the circuitry lens tells me that that region contains a motif for a specific regulator which is disrupted when you have that mutation. So together, we now finally have a handle for the disease. We know the cell type, and we know the regulator against which we should be de developing drugs. And that's exactly what the analysis revolution is about. It's bridging the gap between genetic variants and disease. It's telling us what tissues we should be focusing on. It's telling us what control regions are affected. It's telling us what the target genes are and who the regulators are. And it's telling us how all of that fits together to give rise to the disease and to give rise to all of the intermediate phenotypes that get, then lead to the disease. So I see the path between this traditional medicine, where you're simply doing patchwork and treating the symptoms of the disease rather than the roots of the disease, to the medicine of the future, where you're actually having specialized treatments and prognostics. I see this path as imperative. Blockbuster drugs no longer work. They're a thing of the past. Our aging population has hundreds of new diseases that are coming out. But I also see this change as inevitable. We now have mechanistic hypotheses for hundreds of traits. We are able to reprogram our cells, edit our genomes, edit our networks, 
NIH, academia, pharma, and biotech have all come together, embraced the analysis revolution to change medicine forever. And I have devoted my life to this. Thank you.